And in telling that, there are certain parts of the story that are embedded around other things that came before and came after. So today, I wanted to, to preach a sermon today about from the cradle to the cross. It's kind of a segment of, of Jesus' life about 2,000 and some odd years ago. And it, had, it holds a very special spot in history and in our lives today. So let me say Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, Joyeux Noel, and Froblich Wilmachten. Anybody get that from Germany? No? No. Well, uh, that's Merry Christmas in German. You got it? Okay. <laughs> Wilmachten, Fro Froblich. I guess it's frolicking in the, in the Wiernacht. Uh, anyway. Um, that's all I researched for this morning. But what a wonderful time of year it is to be able to express these kinds of, of things. Uh, I think we all look forward to this time of year every year, don't we? After it's over, we go, wow, that was exhausting. And yet, we're looking forward to the very next time that that rolls around. Lights and manger scenes and Santa Claus with reindeer. I've got a Frosty the Snowman here on my tie. And he's, if you, if you listen very carefully, it does jingle bells. I don't know what Jingle Bells had to do with Frosty. There's two different songs, for the, but it's all about snow and, and winter time. Uh, these are just a few of the things that remind us of this time, this season that we enjoy together. So about the story of the cradle to the cross, I have some questions about this Christmas thing. Number one, was there a plan from God to have a baby? Was that how, is that a plan? Yes. And number two, was the baby Jesus a new person, or did he have a life before he was born? It's a good question. Another question I have, number three, is what was his mission in life? And then number four, did he complete that mission? In order to explore the before his birth event of the Son of God, I want to find out if this was a random event or a well-planned and executed one. The Bible verse to forecast the plan of God to restore that lost relationship uh, between man and the Creator God is found in Genesis 3. You'll recall that Adam, even Adam sinned and that God placed a curse on them, but he also got the culprit, the snake, the serpent. He was pronounced. So in Genesis 3.15, the curse on the snake or the serpent was this. Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I kind of feel like God had a little anger going on in there. I mean, he had his pride and joy, Adam and Eve, and this snake in the grass, this snake in the tree caused everything to change and not in God's favor. And he said to the snake again, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now that's prophetic language. It has, sometimes the prophecies have two meanings, an earthly one and a spiritual one. So we're going to look at that. That's an interesting phrase in the curse of the serpent. I will put enmity between you and and the woman in between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. How does that make any sense? If the curse, if it is Satan being cursed as well as all other snakes, well, that's the physical part of this curse. One time, a long time ago, I had a, a preacher friend of mine, and every time he came to this passage in the Bible, that's a messianic prophecy. I said, well, it looks to me like all snakes have been cursed, not just the devil, uh, that apparently at one time snakes must have had little legs or something. And they, they could move around. And they had other things that God took away as he cursed this particular serpent, but all of his ancestry after him. The, the, the thing that stands out to me is this word enmity. It's not a word we use every day. It, it does mean enemy. It's used in the in the rest of the Bible, that particular idea in the Hebrew, also in the Greek, of an enemy. But it really means hatred. I'm going to put hatred between the snake and a human being. That's the physical part of it. Now, the spiritual part 
That's a whole nother deal. Listen, in, in uh, Luke 23, 12, Herod, the king of the Jews at the time of Jesus' life, and Pilate, he was the Roman governor, two guys from two jurisdictions hated each other. But when it came time to pass Jesus to the other, one to the other, they became friends. Isn't that awful? To think that to crucify or to find guilt in a guiltless man would bring two enemies, two, two guys that hated themselves, that each other, and then all of a sudden make them friends over the demise of this, of this man, Jesus. Spiritually looking at the curse on the serpent, we see that the offspring of this messianic prophecy is Jesus. He's the son of man, but also he's the son of God. The devil was able to make the crucifixion happen. He was able to turn hearts and deceive people into believing that Jesus was evil or that he had malintentions. And so as he was able to make this crucifixion come to life, a spiritual striking at the heel of God himself had taken place. Satan was able to affect the life of the Son of God. He was striking at his heel. But the other side of the curse and the prophecy was that the offspring, Jesus, would crush his head. And that is Satan's head, and we say hallelujah to that. This is the plan of God to restore man to righteousness and therefore a close relationship with the Creator. Other prophecies were proven by history and they're found in other areas. We're going to explore them. But to answer the first question, uh, was Jesus, was the plan of God uh, in place? Yes, this was the plan of God even back to the days of the creation. In Micah, uh, which is a minor prophet in the Old Testament. Maybe you've read some of his things, maybe you haven't. It's, he's not a very popular one, but in there, there is a messianic prophecy. That is a future foretelling of Jesus, the Son of God, to be born. He said, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, well, that's, a, that's a hard to say, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old. So that speaks of Jesus' life even, being before he was born, he was around. Isaiah 7, 14 also says this, another messianic prophecy. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. So you see, there was the life of Christ was as, as God himself. And it was, it was from eternal to eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. He was there. And again, the, the lineage of Christ is prophesied to come by way of Abraham and Jacob. And that's found in Genesis twenty two eighteen. 18. It says, your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, there's that word again, offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And to Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, God spoke this in Numbers 24. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. We, he will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the people of Sheph. Kind of gruesome, but those were the enemies of God. So all these scriptures forecast the birth of Christ as to where he would be born, that his mother would be a virgin, that his ancestry would come from the blessing pronounced to Abraham after he proved to God that his faith was strong by taking his son Isaac, to the altar of sacrifice. And you're probably familiar with this story, um, continuing in that family line with Jacob and then the entire lineage written by Matthew in the first chapter of his gospel account. Matthew recounts all the way back to Adam, the, the uh, lineage of Christ. So showing where he came from there. After the birth of Jesus, just as it had been foretold thousands of years before the actual birth, we see a tragic attempt by Satan to kill the baby. 
This is a horrible section of scripture. Maybe you remember back in the days of Moses where the Pharaoh was getting rid of all the male children that were little children and Moses was saved. Well, same thing happened to Jesus. After, uh, after he was born and Herod learned of the king of the Jews being born after the Magi had gone to them to express where and, and all of the details, uh, then Herod made a plan that he would get rid of the king, the, the young baby king that that king would never compete with him. And the scripture continues the story of hatred in Matthew chapter 2. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. You remember the Magi, these three wise men, these guys from the east. We three kings of Orient are. They had come to worship the baby Jesus because they followed this star. Must have been quite a special star. I mean, people are baffled by this. How could you follow a star? Aren't they too far up? I mean, even if you had some sophisticated hardware or even computers and software, how could you follow over the exact spot in a regular star? Here's what I think. I think that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And that God that day showed these guys where his baby was going to be born, and he was there at the birth of his baby. Now, it's just a theory of mine. You can take it or leave it if you want, but I like it, and I'm hanging on to it. Because, you know, you, you, don't, you don't really get in writing, where was God? Where was Father God in all of this? Was he just sitting on his throne and all this was happening down on earth? I think he was very close by. So here we have this, uh, Jesus is born, the Magi, they're aware of what's going on, so they go around Herod. And so when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Can you imagine the pain of having your children just taken away from you like that, the baby sons, by the authority of the king of, of Israel? This was a sad time in the times of Israel, in the ancient times. And then the Bible continues and says, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. Do you see that God was protecting baby Jesus this entire time? He had an angels surrounding him. He had Joseph being talked to in a dream as to how to exactly get around the hatred that Herod had for the baby Jesus. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was told through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. You see how all this works around? All these complicated structures thousands of years before the fact come into an exact, a perfect alignment with what exactly happened with the baby Jesus. So at this point of the story, we see that the prophecies of the Old Testament, that Jesus was the seed of a woman to crush the head of the serpent, which is Satan, otherwise known as the evil one, Satan's plan was evidently to have God's son killed at childhood, at, ba at babyhood, as a toddler. Does everyone agree that God is more powerful than Satan? I hope so, because he is. The birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary is evidence that the Lord of heaven came down from glory above to be a helpless child. The God of heaven, that being the second person of the Godhead, Jesus. He was protected in the flesh by his stepfather, Joseph, and also by angelic protection as well. The mission of Jesus, as he became a young man, is found in Luke chapter 2. And it says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, 
They went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Before you judge the boy or his parents too harshly, remember that Jesus was born for a mission, and he was becoming ready to fulfill his mission even at the age of 12 years old. Don't forget that many scholars believe Mary to have been just a little older than that when she gave birth to Jesus. She was a very teenage girl by all accounts. At any rate, the boy Jesus was confronted for frightening his parents. That's a crime that's, that most of you are guilty of, I'm sure at some time, frightening your parents, that we've gotten over it. If we're older, we got through it. At any rate, the boy Jesus was confronted for frightening his parents by staying behind to have an adult conversation with the teachers in Jerusalem. These were the big dudes. These were the guys who, who sat around and thought about things, about God and about how the universe worked and the law of Moses and who was God. These were the big shots in faith back in those days. And here's this 12-year-old boy sitting around talking with them and, and the Bible says that his answers astounded them. That's how special Jesus is and was and will always be. In Luke 2, 49, it says, He said to them, Why did you seek me? Why did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I went over to the King James here. So if you're reading in an NIV, I get it. I just love the way it says, My father's business. That he was about his father's business. What business was that? He was God. He was in the God business. Even though he was human, he was God. He was about his father's business. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. How can you understand that? You're a mom and dad. You've got your little baby boy right there. 12 years old, right? They all know everything by that age, right? This day and age. Actually, the closer you get to 18, you really know everything. I, I once uh, saw a thing sitting on a refrigerator with a magnet that said, uh, move out now uh, that you're, you're uh, 18 while you know everything. And, <laughs> you know, get a job and move out. But, you know, that's not true because as soon as that happens, mom and dad are going to get a call. Hey, can I borrow some money? I, need, I can't pay rent this month. Yeah. When, when uh, the, the boy Jesus had exhibited such wisdom, he was respected even then at that age. Then he went down and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all of these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. At age 30, Luke 3.23 states that Jesus began his ministry. You might also say that he officially began his mission for which he was born to complete, his mission from God. After three and a half years of preaching the gospel message to his own people, the Jews, he was arrested by those very Jewish leaders and finds himself before Pilate. So what was his mission? What did Jesus say was his mission? Okay, he was born. There was a plan in place by God. He was born to fulfill that mission according to Scripture. Now what? In John 18, 36. Now Jesus is beaten up. He's before Pilate, and Pilate is questioning him, not really getting this whole thing. Why do these guys hate him so bad? It looks like a nice guy to me. That was my words, not in the Bible. But now I'll go to the Bible. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's an astounding statement. My kingdom is not of this world. Remember that, folks. We serve a God of a world that encompasses all of our boundary lines between North America and Canada between the southern border to Mexico, uh, all of the borders that we have at our airports where people come in from other countries. These are carnal kingdoms. These are uh, national uh, human environments. But Jesus is over all that. His kingdom is not of this world. So he said, if it were, if this were my planet, if this was my town, if it, you're, then you're in my mansion. doesn't say that, but he says, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Where do you think that is? Is he referring to heaven there? My kingdom is from another place. He's from another, another dimension. He's from so above all what we see here in our little world 
We're like ants compared to him. We're like just doing our little thing. We're not, on, we're not aware of anything going on in the big picture. And here is Jesus. He says, so uh, Pilate retorts. He says, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world, listen to this, is to testify to the truth. What happens, guys? Year after year after year, people dilute and pollute the truth. So we don't know how old is our earth. We don't know, you know, if did dinosaurs and human beings walk together? If you go to any class of, of, of um, teaching science and, and the, the evolution of man, they're going to say, oh, no, they never did. They, they, don't, they don't get to walk in the same age as one was millions and billions of years ago, and one was hundreds of thousands of years ago. And, and I know I've talked on this before, but this is how Satan worked. He erodes the truth. So God sent his son Jesus, born of a virgin, to set the record straight again. He said, I came to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. There's a lot of people in this world, I would venture to say most of the people in this world, who have got no interest in hearing the truth. Whatever advances their own personal, selfish desires, that's what they want to do. But nobody wants to hear that Jesus was called to come down here and save us from ourselves. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Can you imagine how sarcastic that must have sounded? How awful that must have sounded to those those uh, Pharisees that had brought him up there, the chief priests and even King Herod and all anybody in his court, for him to say that, you want me to give you back the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Barabbas was, was a guy who deserved to be punished. Jesus was not. The crowd wanted the one who had committed the crimes and wanted to kill the one who never did. My friends, Jesus, the Son of God, was on a mission to save you and I from the lies of the devil by testifying to the truth. Christmas is about the truth. The truth is that the Christmas story is just part of the whole story of God. God created man in a perfect place, and it was man who believed the lies of Satan. <coughs> Having been punished by banishment to a fallen world where we live now, God made a plan even as fresh as the pronouncement on the curse of man and woman to restore the relationship we once had with God. Do you remember the story about Adam walking in the cool of the evening, walking with God and talking about things? Well, see, that's what God's heart is. He wants that. He wants you and I to walk in the cool of the garden with him. It's a, good, it's a good life. He doesn't want us to be in the fallen world and be always believing the lie and always turning away from him. God's plan required Jesus to be born of a woman in order to die for all mankind so that we may be restored to our, our maker once again, even though we live on this earth. It's a miracle. We can live by the Spirit for Him in expectation of living with Him in glory once again as He intended for us in the beginning. As we celebrate the reason for the season, let us also remember that Jesus is the same yesterday. He's the same today. And He's the same forever, forever. He didn't change. We are the ones that need to change to be more like Him. Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope this season brings about great things for you. I hope that maybe your personal relationship with the Lord will become greater, that you might be called even to a greater understanding of who he is and what he wants from you. I'm looking for that in my life. I want to do all that I can for the Lord, all that I'm able to do. And isn't it great that, that Jesus doesn't require us to do anything that we're not able to do? 
He only gives us what we are able to do and to give it to him. So there, there's your story. There's the story for you to bring out to the people at whatever Christmas party you go to or whatever uh, Christmas banquet you do on Tuesday, whether it's opening presents. Please remember, you know, sing happy birthday to Jesus if you want. I mean, this, it's just part of the story. The whole story of recognizing who Jesus is, is, is really who we are in relation to him. If you're not a Christian today, I ask you to come up and make that known, that you would become a Christian. If you'd like to be baptized, we'll figure out a pool. Is it warm or is it cold? Uh, we don't care. We don't care, right? If it's a great occasion, we'll go in there with wet suits if we have to. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to have prayed about, we offer this time. It's just a great time. Jesus, Jesus.